Okay, so my name is Philip Martin, and I'm the co-owner of Philip Martin Gallery here in Los Angeles with Portia Hein. And I hope that you've had a chance to meet Portia either at the gallery or at the fairs. I'm really delighted that everyone could turn up today to uh, enjoy a conversation with John Joseph Mitchell on the subject of his show here in LA. John, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Guess you got a little snow there in uh, in uh, New Jersey. Yeah, we did get like six inches. So yeah, get some uh, pretty pictures. Go for a walk a little later, and hopefully get to make some snow painting soon. Oh, nice. Okay, yeah. exciting. Um, well, there's there's a lot to get into uh, snow paintings. Um, so here we have just a couple uh, installation shots of the show. The exhibition is called Forty One Paintings of Summer and Fall. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the title and 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 some of the things you're trying to do here in this this body of work? Yeah, absolutely. Titles for, for paintings and shows to me seem best when it's uh, simple and uh, sounds right, has a nice ring to it, and 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 is evocative of the most straightforward sort of idea that. I'm trying to get across. So um, when we started talking about doing this show, it was, I guess, last uh, last winter, early spring, and uh, started making paintings a few weeks after that for it. And it covered the summer and fall, and um, that's the amount of paintings I made. Mm -hmm. So the so the most straightforward reason for it is that that's what the show is, but it also does a real good job, I think, of the content being um, explained and then also giving a sort of, uh, what's the word, like a, a calendar of, of when they were made, you know? So they not only point to the pictures, they point to where I was and, and, the, and the truth of that. So I, I like the way that that sort of coincides. So when you, then, use, yeah, go ahead. When you use the word content, mm -hmm. um, what do you mean there with that, with that word with regard to this body of work? So the content is the most, the, the nameable things in the picture, you know, the non-formal things in the picture, the sky, the trees, the, the people, and they, are very, very real to me, very much tied to time and place. Mm -hmm. um, place being my my home and the region around it, and, and, and the time being specific times of days and, and seasons. I do my best to, to have color capture, capture some of that, be the sort of uh, marker for time. Mm -hmm. So in a painting like, say, this one, for example, how do how does a painting like this one get started? Um, so that is a picture that I made real quick. I made the drawing and the the, the sketch for it real quick. I was sitting here facing the opposite direction, mm -hmm. working on my easel, looked out the left, out the window, and perfectly framed by the um by the top corner of the window and the gable of my porch was this bird perched on the steep pitched roof next door. Uh -huh. And uh, it, it just, it, it was very much, very easy to compose that picture and, and, and start with that. And then um, from there, you start trying to pare down uh, color arrangements really. And, mm -hmm. I always try to have some note of of reality of of observed reality in in my color mm -hmm. and start with one color. So the sky was very much that color. It was that nice, cool, um, light blue that you get on a on a summer overcast day. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of the construction of a painting like this, and we can be moving on to other paintings. Mm -hmm. Tell me about then maybe what adding a second color say does or how you start to build color relationships. Yeah, so with like 
So when you start, when I start with one color that to me is is true, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. it gives me the opportunity to find um, more expressive colors that both uh, flatten the image in a way mm -hmm. by playing with various contrast temperature relationships but then also try to build space at the same time. So I really try to let color be um, an element of, of the surface pattern of the, of the immediate surface design of the picture, mm -hmm. but then also with the value and the temperature range, try to allow it to be space. So your eye gets to be pleased by the, the, the pictorial illusion as well as just the surface design. So in a, in a painting like this, there was very much that red chair uh, actually at my brother's house down the street. We were cleaning out his garage. We were scattering stuff in the yard. And that chair was there, and I liked it. I liked the color against the green. And so I start from that green. Well, that blue, the, the blue-green that becomes the, the background of, like, the, the tree line behind it, that, that value shift from the light green to the dark green is always going to create a separate uh, layer of space. Anytime you go from one value to another, you're going to give the opportunity for another degree of space. But having it be the same value and and sort of polar uh, opposite color of the chair, so it's the same value as the chair, but also the opposite temperature, you just get that sort of play between um, the tension between space and, and flatness. And that's that's sort of the the goal with the the beginning point of most of my decisions is is how do I exploit both the the flatness and the perceived space that's always going to occur. And so when we look at a painting like this one or the one we saw before, mm -hmm. do you have the end sense of the composition and theme kind of in mind? Meaning like, did you visualize you were gonna have four boats in this picture? Or are we also kind of responding to the painting as we're making it, um, maybe understanding what the painting needs or what the painting is doing in terms of our conversation with this material object and how it's affecting us, but also how it's sparking memories of places that you've been, because you're working from observation in a sense, but you're not, at least I assume in this body of work, or perhaps at this point in your career, like in a studio looking at a still life, like really directly, literally doing that. Although no doubt you have many years of that, many years of that. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you have any response to just kind of some of those topics? Yeah, sure. So I, I try to, there's sort of two stages of, of a painting for me. There's, there's, the design, there's the, the, the composing of, of the shapes mm -hmm. and, and the forms and, and the lines, and there's color. And mm -hmm. I try to get the design and the drawing um, sort of as quickly as possible. I think my uh, sort of, uh, my ability, my strongest ability is in, is in drawing and design. Mm -hmm. So the, the quickest I can get that down and trust that that's going to be interesting and and um, and expressive of the visual experience I just had on my on my walk or or what have you. The quicker I can get that down, the better. And then try not to be fussy about that. Try not to move things around too much. And then let my slow deliberation be with color and be with playing with color. So. Design usually happens pretty quick, you know, in, in one session and then color and wiping things away and painting over and shifting color that happens over the course of weeks, sometimes months. 
Interesting. So, so that's, yeah. do you do you work from from an, a drawing that you might have made, or do you tend to draw on the panel itself? Um, I would say about fifty percent of the time, I'm working from a previous drawing or um, a, a monotype of print or uh, a small little painting I've done, even smaller painting than these. Um, so a, a lot of the time. Um, yeah, it comes from a previous sort of worked out thing that that becomes translated into the into the panel pen. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna move on, but I want the audience to just to know that this is the Tuckahoe River. And mm -hmm. I found that to be an interesting thing. Someone, you know, here we are in Southern California. Um, and I'm pretty Californian at this point, although I'm from Indiana. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't know the area of Southern New Jersey where you live. And someone mm -hmm. at the opening um, said, you know, they, they, they were like, well, what's the Tuckahoe River? And they looked it up and they said it's a black river, which I had never heard of, which you explained is uh, an acidic river that is in a few very specific locations in the United States, acidic rivers. And you mentioned they're in Michigan, the part of uh, of uh, New Jersey where you are and also in Louisiana mm -hmm. and that they're formed by um, the water draining through cedars and acidic um, and they create these black sort of brown to black rivers in this mm -hmm. area and you have things like cranberry bogs but you also mentioned iron bogs because people yeah. are quite literally harvesting this iron that's leached out through this process so it just sounds like a very bucolic area and an area that you're really connected to. I know we were just describing kind of how you make the paintings, but also subject matter is so important to see to your life here. And your title even alludes to Hokusai in some sense, in terms of that sense of place. So yeah. anyway, I just felt like I should say that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, no, the place, place is extremely important to me because well for a couple of reasons I, I i enjoy living here and being here but mm -hmm. in the way that i found of of working of of painting i you know taking information from out in the world and then distilling it down to formal shapes and formal concepts being in the area that I know best and dealing with the area that I know best mm -hmm. makes that easier. I know these, I know these shapes, I know these colors, you know, very well. They're, they're sort of, they're, they're in my brain already. So it just seems to make sense to, if my, you know, in, in painting, my main concern is, uh, well, in, in the formal aspect of painting, my main concern is his color and shape. Well, dealing with colors and shapes that I know has helpful. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, that's very interesting because, you know, of course, I mean, was that so you so you were in Philadelphia for like mm -hmm. 10 years, which isn't yeah. so far from where you are, but you did make a decision to move back to essentially where you're from. You, yeah. teach, at, you teach at your alma mater for undergrad. Mm -hmm. um, was that a difficult decision to to go back to to this place that you know well or did it just seem obvious and make sense or was it no it was obvious it made sense it was it was always in the cards i've always very much had a foot in each place um my father's family's from philadelphia so growing up there was lots of time spent there anytime i wanted to go to a you know concert or museum anything as a teenager i was getting in the car and driving to philadelphia so it's they're 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 not totally different places to me. One's, mm -hmm. one's just the city and one's not. Mm -hmm. But they're the same world in my mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just interesting because I think artists are, you know, you're a visual traveler. And yeah. we live in a world where we see so much more than people could possibly have imagined. I mean, Walter Benjamin always talks about the arcades of Paris as opposed to the village that someone mm -hmm. come from that 
you know, in a village, you might never see a stranger, really. I mean, it wasn't really something that would happen to you. And then he's talking about the arcades of Paris. And obviously now we have the internet and all the rest of it. Um, And in my own visual life, you know, I was in Indiana, which is this thing that I love. It's what I grew up with. I can't, I don't know if it would mean anything to anyone else, but it, it means a lot to me because I grew up with it. I know it's visual rhythms and it's such, but then moved to Southern California, which is something completely different. Mm-hmm. And I just think, you know, it's 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 intellectually challenging to do these things, which is, of course, why we love to travel and do, do these sorts of things. But it's also emotionally hard. I mean, was it did it make is there a kind of contentment or or is it long term observation? I mean, what is it what is it like to really have meditated on a place in the for the length of time that you have and that I assume you will continue to do? Um. Well, I think it's I think it is long term trying to know something intimately trying to acquaint yourself with with something being a, 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 in this case a place as mm-hmm. intimately as possible and sort of see it new every day i think that is a mm-hmm. huge part of my uh effort mm-hmm. essentially in making in making these paintings in being in, being an artist um mm-hmm. being a painter is to see the familiar mm-hmm. through 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 newness, you know. Every yeah, totally. <laughs> every time I go out into the woods across the street, I I have to try to find something new and exciting and and mm-hmm. and interesting. And and in that way, that that is that is traveling. That is what traveling does for us. Traveling yeah. is the is the is the easy way to do that because the thing is inherently new, the place is inherently new. But so, so we're very much eased into that relationship with the world around us when we travel, where we say, oh, I've never seen that building before. I've never seen that river before. But that type of, and we feel this hangover when we get home normally. We feel a, a, a sort of appreciation for the things we know. We have that sort of freshness, that excitement still baked into our being. And that lasts for a couple of days. Well, with making with making pictures and looking at at the same things over and over, um, that is a that is a bit of an adventure. Truly, yeah. um, that there is a sense of excitement and adventure in that. That uh, how how did the how did the tree change color today? You know, what am I seeing differently today? Mm-hmm. And uh, that that is uh, so so through making pictures i think i love and know my surroundings more than if i didn't make pictures it's not the only way to love and know your surroundings but it's 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 it is my way well your show does this amazing thing because there's 41 paintings Mm -hmm. um you locate your viewer very bodily very humanly in this place it feels like a real human journey yeah and that's the 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 goal for me in in terms of communication, mm-hmm. um, which I'm not necessarily sure painting is the best form of communication, but it is a form of communication. <laughs> and the the goal for me in terms of uh, the the sort of uh, yeah linguistic and emotional communication is to share simply what I see and what I feel about what I see. Yeah. And in that type of immediate uh, engagement on my part with the materials and the painting and, and capturing that, whatever that experience I had was, hopefully, the other person, whoever's looking at the painting, is not going to have that experience, but they are going to have an experience from it. And yeah. hopefully it feels sincere and real and observed. And hopefully that just carries through into the way they look at, you know, their their surroundings. Yeah. And I think, well, I think that, that, that yeah, that's that's really that's the a pretty constant goal. And uh yeah. Well, that's what paintings I think can really do. You yeah, know, sure. you, you know, you're not looking at the thing. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, the 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 artist gets you to a place where you feel as if you are looking at the thing, but you know you're not. Mm -hmm. And um, and then what you do instead is you, I think, through recognizing the kind of human interface or the humanity of the maker, in a lot of ways, if you trust that person's as a maker, then you start to trust yourself as a viewer in that place. Yeah. yeah. yeah and then exactly. you give you give more to yourself emotionally in terms of mm -hmm. what a painting can do. You have a soaring experience with a painting. Um, photographs are hard. They don't really work that way often. I mean, maybe you have a Wolfgang Tillmans, which is what makes him kind of a remarkable photographer. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you have any thoughts to my, my little ramble. <laughs> no, no, for sure. Photography's sort of unique capacity is in is in is in documentation and capturing very, very, very finite moments. Mm -hmm. And I think the it doesn't necessarily transcend and and inform the way that the viewer might look at the work its interest is in is in capturing and documenting mm -hmm. and, it's, and that's its you know capacity in its most profound way um, yeah and it well, it's profound. interesting because there's i always come back to that de la roche comment where he says, you know, after today, photography is dead. And he's talking, I mean, he's a history painter from the mm -hmm. 1820s. And he's talking about what he perceives at that point to be the role in, of painting is over. For but sure. What's interesting is that there's a fascinating new book on Bonard that I just think is unbelievable. That's the woman is, it's I've got a purple cover. It's from, I think it's Yale Press. Her name's Lucy. Mm -hmm. I don't quite remember. She's British. It's an incredible book. She's super good. Her writing is amazing. And, um, but she, what she says about Bonard is that what Bonard liked about Cubism was that he felt that Cubism broke the dependence that people had developed for photography and that they could see the painting differently. And that's very interesting because of course, one thinks about Cubism in terms of creating space, blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, um, this notion that in a certain sense, what it's doing is making any kind of human art making possible is really fat. It's just really fascinating. Um, again, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, yeah. So yeah, very interesting there. Yeah. And, and so the, the unique capacity of painting is in the, this dual existence between perceived space and decorative design. Yeah. And, 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 and decorative design meaning formal elements arranged in a pleasing way. Yeah. And the tension between pictorial space and that decorative design is something only painting can do. That is its unique capacity at this point. Mm -hmm. So, um, painting as was um, basically developed through Western history up to the point of photography was, is indeed dead, was dead. Photography did replace the capacity to document mm -hmm. and capture a finite moment in time or be a document of a person, of a, of a, you know, a portrait sitter or what have you. Mm -hmm. But it's, life and its role as far as I'm concerned is in that capacity to do both those things at once. And yeah. I think um, cubism was the very expressive, like blowing up of that capacity. Mm -hmm. But I think the impressionists and the post-impressionists yeah. really started to hone in on that. And yeah. I think they started to hone on that because of the way in which um, Japanese art became available to them. Totally, and yes. And right. my big my big interest in Japanese prints yes. 
of the 17th, of the 18th and 19th centuries is that they were always, um, for whatever reason, they were always seeing the world through that dual capacity. Yeah. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure why, I'm not sure what it was about the time and place or their cultural, social, you know, apparatus was that that created that sense, but they were always doing the dual, the dual thing. And yeah. um, talk more about that because you know, honestly, that's not I don't know a lot about Japanese art really at all. So um so first off, Japanese art's primal medium is, is printmaking. Mm -hmm. And in traditional uh, ukiyo-e printmaking, there is a designer, there are carvers, there are inkers, and there are publishers. The publisher funds the whole operation. But then the thing is made by three sets of people. And um, in, in its existence as a print its purpose is to be um cheap affordable and widely distributed mm -hmm. the opposite of painting really and so they're not precious they were they they did they're not they're not precious commodities um and in the way in that way they're probably not precious designs i don't you know the concept of an artist didn't really exist to them they were designers they were illustrators. Um, Hokusai and Hiroshiga, you know, they, they didn't have a concept of being an artist mm -hmm. and, and, and others like them. And so my sort of pet recent theory is that in this division of, of labor, of the making of things, uh, abstraction inherently develops because the sort of the process the mind, the observation is interrupted. It's interrupted by means of, of production. It's interrupted by the material, by knives and wood. You can't simply depict what you see. You have to manipulate it through this, this material. It's interrupted by that division of labor. And so maybe that's where their inherent sort of uh, formal abstract leaning comes from. I don't know, yep. that's sort of what I've been thinking about recently. In terms of, and of course, you have a background in printmaking. I mean, um, and have done yeah. a, a lot of it. Yeah. Lot um, I'm sorry. No, I would go ahead. Yeah. So my my earliest sort of visual uh, love was 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 album covers, and I would just copy album covers, and I would make. Uh, make drawings and then I learned that they were prints and I started to figure out how how they how things were printed and um, screen printing and lithography became a huge interest and that's what I went to undergraduate school for. And so the process of planning a picture, composing a picture and then um, having to organize it and structure it, so that it can work in a specific medium, you know, in screen print, you get mm -hmm. through color separations and in in wood wood block printing, you have to do some element of color registration and registering of the, the paper. And so this this like this step process has always been very much my uh not natural way of working, but it's the way I learned to work mm -hmm. from the those beginnings and so when it came to me trying to learn how to paint and and figure out painting and um going down that road it was really hard for me to just pick up a brush and start I just ended up making a mess all the time and it wasn't until I figured mm -hmm. out how to uh at least trick myself into making it into a step process you know, or, or think of it that way that I felt like I had a handle on it. And, and so that's, that's why the things get, that's why I make the, the, the panels and frame it and then, and then gesso it and stain it and then carve into it. It's just this way of breaking things up into steps so that I can interrupt my mind and, and deal with the, 
the the the, the reality of the material and the right. reality right. of the forms at hand and not get caught up in the in the picture aspect of it yeah that's super interesting yeah so just to clarify the frames are made by you yeah um and the paintings are framed before they're painted yeah so i build a panel put the frame on and then they get painted and worked the whole time yeah and sometimes um i there's too much paint on the frame and i have to abandon a painting because i, I didn't like the frame you know and so things become you know there, there's more sort of complexity in it that way but it's the way i feel like i need to be doing it right now because it, again it's the way of sort of this like mental interruption where it's just not only about a picture yeah mm -hmm. well we're approaching the end here um is there anything that you might want to talk about that we haven't talked about so far um i suppose um I could talk a little bit about the the sort of surface texture mm -hmm. of the paintings because I guess that's one thing that doesn't come yeah. across in the photos and one thing we haven't touched on and um, it's something that I think is is important. It, there's needs to be a I try to keep like a physical reality uh, or honesty to the mm -hmm. thing so that you can identify the, the material parts mm -hmm. so that it always, this looks like a, this looks like paint on wood, you know, mm -hmm. I want that, that very immediate understanding of at least some of how the thing is made or and what it's made of to be there. Mm -hmm. Obviously a person can't see every layer of paint but they can see, they can see those those truths, and I think that is uh, plays back into and is a part of this this thing that painting does uniquely, which mm -hmm. is the that dual reality of of surface formal design or objecthood and mm -hmm. and pictorial you know illusionistic space. Mm -hmm. And so um, yeah, the, the, often the paintings have have a have a texture to them that is um very much paint on wood yeah yeah well they're all and then a lot a lot of the lines are carved into the painting mm -hmm. yeah yeah and uh i actually use different uh wood carving tools and nails and yeah. even some like clay um sculpting tools and stuff to yeah. get the different kinds of lines and it reminds me of course of you know how one carves a plate Sure, sure, yeah. Well, there's a lot of other things for us to talk about, but I think uh, we've hopefully made a good start. I mm -hmm. really appreciate your taking the time to join us today, John, to share your work with us. And I really appreciate uh, everybody coming out um, to view the webinar. If you have any questions about any of the work, you know, just send an email. Um, and I hope that everyone is doing well and that everyone is safe and their loved ones are safe since it's a complicated time in the world right now. Um, and I hope that art can can help us um, remember our shared humanity. So thank you, John. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Take care.